We now will hear from two individuals, good friends of mine each, coming from a tradition that saved lives. Stan led services from the time I can remember. He has been the mainstay, the benevolent godfather um, for the Synagogue of the Hills. And Stan had this building, it was a rental house, and he donated it to the synagogue to use as a house of worship. And the room that you see here, the sanctuary, I believe was the living room. But there's a very close, small, and loving community. And Stan has always been the leader, and we're very proud of his leadership in the state as well, and his generosity. I don't know if we would have been an organized congregation had it not been for Stan. He's been the hinge. He's held us together. Stan has been a driving force, not only for the Jewish community, but for the community at large. His philanthropy and his dedication to Rapid City, I think, is unassailable. He has a way of, of getting everybody's input uh, and, and from that distill a, a, if not a solution, at least a direction. I don't think you can call him a Wizard of Oz because there, there, there's no curtain to pull back. You know, he is who he is. You all know that he is generous to a fault with his resources, but more important, he's generous to a fault with his time, with his person, with his insights, with his network of acquaintances uh, and friends to put us in contact with whomever we need to address an issue, address a problem. He takes nothing for granted. He is not so rigid and set in stone with regard to one side of the argument to the other. He, he's very receptive, he has been receptive to point, counterpoint. Nowhere else in the world, at least in the last 250 years, maybe the last 5,000 years, could a Jew have been given the opportunities that I had anywhere else except in George Washington's United States? That's what the United States is really about. I love this state. I want people to know that you can be from South Dakota and make a huge difference. And then if you're a Jew, we have an exceptional opportunity. No one does anything worthwhile alone. There is no such thing as the self-made man, and there's no such thing as an individual hero, at least in the social world I've lived in. I think of South Dakota being in the center of the United States like the center of the body of America. And I think that Kadoka, South Dakota, where my grandmother eventually came from the homestead and ran a general store, I think of that as the heart of America, and it still is. It was in a place where a Jewish woman was accepted, like everyone else, in fact, more than accepted. In Martin, South Dakota, they charged a 10% fee for taking the $25 allotment check that an Indian received. They found out that there was this woman over in Kadoka who was kind of different, but she didn't. She really thought that was immoral. When she was ringing up the bill, when the money was, was gone, uh, the whole $25, if that's what it was, or however much they were gonna spend, then she kind of kept the, the, the pile that they'd paid for and then the pile they hadn't. And then uh, she would look and she could sense there might be a one or two pieces that they really wanted. What Grandma would do would be to push those items over into the pile that had been paid for. First time she did it, the family or whoever it would would push it back. 
She would do it a second time and they would push it back. And the third time they'd keep it. I had a real problem with the rest of the world and the Christian world with the fact that half the children my age were murdered and no one seemed to care. My first term in the legislature, I was in the Appropriations Committee. Appropriations were invited over to Memorial Lutheran Church to talk about the appropriation for that year. Then at the end, they had a gift for every legislator. And as I watched them open the little boxes, there was a beautiful Black Hills Gold Cross. So I told Linda, what do I do now? And with her usual indirect directness, she said, just say thank you and sit down. But when I opened the box, there was a Star of David <laughs> that I always wear. When you have a prejudice, you see crosses everywhere, you try to look the other way, uh, things are, anyway, they, they, they relieved, I began to see Christians as doing what the Jew Jesus won't outline. And I've got a whole new world, and I thank them for that. But we all have prejudices against other religions, other races, other life choices. Let's just pause for a minute and think about, do we really know the person? Is it really reasonable? And it's a terrible burden. One of the great problems, both politically and socially and economically, was the exclusion of Jews from country clubs. Because that's where a lot of business was done, so Jews were limited to how far they could go in some companies. But my good friend Larry Owen, once again a classical South Dakota, and he really built Black Hills Corporation to what it now is. The city wanted to build a new major civic center, or whatever, and they wanted the chamber to be a leader in it. We talked. He said, "Why don't you make a statement that you're not going to support this public facility?" unless the current country club uh, takes, uh, allows uh, black people and Jews. And he got it done. My father was negotiating to buy 1702 West Boulevard, the house I grew up in. As he was negotiating, his friend Art Dahl knew about it and he called my father. And he said, the doctor is not really a good businessman and, and and I, I know you, what you've offered, and you know, why don't you wait till we foreclose and you'll pay less? Well, Dad said, no, I'll tell you, Art, there's a, there's a saying in, in our faith of, that you never want to drink your tea with someone else's tears in it. So I want to raise my family in that house, and I don't want to raise it in a house that I purchased had pain to someone else. Well, as it happened, that doctor was pretty well known to not like Jews. He talked about it. And when Art Dahl and anyone who, any of us who knew Art Dahl, he wanted to tell stories all the time, everybody. So when he told the doctor that, the doctor said, I didn't know Jews were like that. I don't even know why I don't like them. And the fun thing, that doctor's family and his children and grandchildren heard it, and so we all kind of know that story. I had a call one day when I was in the legislature uh, and uh, from the majority leader in the state senate. And he said, Stan, uh, I've had some complaints about the fact you're going to appear on a, on a platform with George McGovern. Yes, uh, yeah, so. Well, I have two senators from East River that are really ticked off and two from West River. And I said, I know who they are. And then my phone went dead. My cell phone, because I just had come off a plane. So as I drew into Rapid City, I got madder and madder. And I called him back and I said, let me tell you something, Eric. Um, the, uh, as I left the airport, you know, the airport, the flag on the, on the flagpole was standing straight out in the wind. And let me tell you something, Eric, 
as long as that flag flies, I can do anything I effing well please. I can speak to anyone I effing well want to on any subject that I effing well want to, and I have no obligation to the effing Republican caucus or the effing Republican party. I'm only obligated to the citizens of District 32, where I've lived my whole life. And just for your effing information, I canceled last Monday. My company was a low bidder on a job in Utah. And uh, the reason we were low bidder is we had found a farm that was, was for sale and that we were going to buy the farm and then make, uh, make the aggregate. And I was invited to dinner in, in, in Ogden by the largest company, much bigger than Northwestern, but in Utah based, and because the CEO knew my father. So I thought we were invited to dinner to talk with him. We were about to have dinner, and he said, we'd like to sell you the aggregate for the job for so many dollars a ton. Well, that was, it was th over $300,000 more than we had bid the job base. We left a lot of money on the table. I said, no, we're going to make our own. He said, uh, how? And I said, we own this farm. And he said to me, uh, what are you going to do about the excavation permit? There are five commissioners, and I own four of them, county commissioners. So I said, we'll take care of that. So the next morning, we always had a local bank to write checks and stuff. I went to the bank and I said, does the Mormon Church have a big youth program here? No. Uh, what about the uh, boys clubs? No. Well, do you have any youth program? Oh, yeah, we have the largest Boy Scout group in the United States, like 13,000 boys. Do you, anybody in the bank related to them? Oh, sure, the, the um, chief of their Planning happens to be our, our, our trust officer. Could I meet him? And so he came down, and I said, well, where do you teach your kids to swim? He said, well, that's a real problem because there's no place to do it here. We have to transport everybody by bus, and it's a real problem. I said, what would you do if um, you had a 20-acre uh, lake on 92nd Street? He said, yeah, and I'd like to have wings to fly. Oh, and, and then Lake would have, we'd have Sandy Beach. Sandy Beach here? Yeah. Well, I have a little bit of a problem. I need to excavate 20, ac 20 acres that is going to create a lake. And as it happens, we're going to take the coarse rock, the aggregate, and it, we have an excess amount of sand which is waste from the from the operation and so we're, we're going to have to leave it there and we would give that to the Boy Scouts if you think you could prevail on the county commission to give you an excavation permit because it didn't take a genius thing get 23,000 parents grandparents and uncles and so it was interesting in a way it would be kind of a tradition of, uh, where where you do stuff for other people. I, and I never thought about it until I was writing this book. And in fact, they had a little plaque uh, where they had established a Morris E. Adelstein Aquatic Park, named it for my father. And the newspaper had a nice editorial about how this Jewish contractor from South Dakota was going to give a lake. That's a story in the book. It's just been fun because we can, as long as that flag flies. People who write autobiographies often see this as the last hurrah, the, the, the final period at the end of a sentence. I don't see that at all. I just see it as the beginning of the next chapter. <laughs>